I'm uh, John Duffy, professor here. Got a couple titles up there. Um, I teach IP, specifically I teach uh, patent law, among other things. Um, but I teach other areas in the, in the uh, law school. Um, and I thought for, I was asked to do this talk by the admissions office. And I wanted to um, give you this slideshow, which, which shows you the professors who are here. Because I think, first of all, that's what you're paying for. You're paying for us to teach you. And you should know at each school that you're admitted to, or which each school you're thinking of going to, who are the people who are going to be teaching you? What are their accomplishments? What are their credentials? Um, and what's their overall philosophy of the field? So that's what this slideshow is going to try to do. So I'm going to start off with uh, one of our most senior members of the faculty, period, not just in IP generally, Ed Kitch, who's a, quite a bit of a hero of mine. He, um, he went to, uh, uh, he, he, a lot of his work, I've, I've written on some of his work. Some of his work is quite pathbreaking, uh, indeed, including this piece, The Nature and Function of the Patent System. When I teach the law and economics of, of, uh, of intellectual property, specifically the law and economics of the patent system, I start with one very famous mid-20th century article that details the four traditional theories of a patent system. Um, and then I have to add in a fifth. Um, and this is not just me, this is everybody. Everybody has to add in Ed Kitch's theory of the, of the patent system, which is called the prospect theory of the patent system. And you know, he begins this essay by saying it, he argues that the patent system performs a function not previously recognized. And he says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make this system, I'm going to sh uh, show this function of the patent system, make it more understandable, what have been puzzling features of the patent system. And it reintegrates the patent institution with the general theory of property rights. And you know what? He did it. He actually did exactly what he claims in this first paragraph. Um, and it's one of the most cited articles in intellectual property period, certainly one of the most cited articles in the patent system. Um, but that's not the only thing he did. He wrote this, I think, really great article on the law and economics of information. And you're going to see that my talk today is going to blur over not just things that we traditionally think about as intellectual property, but also things in related fields. And especially the law and economics of information, valuable information, is something that is, um, is very much on my mind. And, and the people here at UVA are, are definitely thinking about that, not just thinking about the traditional fields of intellectual property. And I love some parts of this. I, I love, you know, he's an iconoclast. He likes to think outside the box. And here's one thing that you hear a lot of times, that information is freely flowable. It just sort of flows like water across the, uh, across the world. Indeed, our founder of this university, Thomas Jefferson, has this famous letter where he says, like, ideas just flow from one person to another quite easily. I can light the taper of someone else, and it diminishes mine, not at all. So there's this idea that, well, information is easy. It's easy to transmit information. And he has, he's the iconoclast. He says, no, information is hard to transmit. It's hard to steal. How does he know this? Well, he says he spends the whole semester teaching. And at the end, he realizes, he reads the exam and realizes he's been imperfectly successful at transmitting the information, um, which I think is, is quite interesting and, and, and is really true. I mean, we have a whole, you know, multi-billion, hundreds of billions of dollar industry in this, in this country called higher education that's just devoted to trying to transfer what I know to you. And that is hard to do, um, which is something that I think is really uh, quite fundamental. Thomas Knockbar is, um, it teaches a lot in antitrust, which is one of the adjacent fields. Um, but he's also written on the constitutional uh, aspects of intellectual property. This is one of the leading articles on the constitutional aspects of intellectual property. Intellectual property is kind of interesting because it is in the Constitution. It was a really radical thing to do in 1787 for the framers of our Constitution in enumerating the powers of Congress. We only had 18 clauses. To stick one, to devote one of those clauses to intellectual property, it was kind of a gamble. It was kind of like well, there's this new thing. It's, it wasn't that old. The, the, the whole history of intellectual property was, at that time, only about 300 years old. And it was kind of still in its infancy. It didn't have such economic resonance that it does today. Um, anyway, he is one of the, uh, the, the best experts on the constitutional aspects of the intellectual property clause, which I think is, uh, is, a, is a great asset to our school. 
He teaches in this adjacent field of antitrust, and he's uh, most recently, I, I just read one of his, his papers, forthcoming in the Virginia Law Review, on um, the antitrust of platforms, of, of things like markets that have platforms. This is a sort of very important idea, not just in intellectual property, but more generally commerce, about large platforms like Amazon or YouTube or other platforms that um, have, uh, have great importance in our economy, and, and the Supreme Court has been, and commentators as well, have been struggling with how to evaluate these kind of two-sided markets. Very interesting topic. Dotan Oliar is a professor um, who teaches mainly copyright, um, and I'm going to put up one of his greatest hits articles, which is about copyright and stand-up comedy, which I read and think is funny, but I wish I could be a stand-up comic. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm a professor. I get, I get paid to stand up and, and, and talk, but I don't get very many laughs. Um, but I think this is a great, uh, great article that he and a co-author did um, and uh, you know, published in, in our own hometown law review. Um, but he's also quite interested in the theory of, of, of property and the theory of intellectual property. This is a great article about so-called first possession, which is a very big issue in property. When do you get property? There's this old case that you'll learn in first year law school about hunters chasing a fox. And the question is, who gets the fox? Is it the first person to hunt the fox or chase the fox, or is it the person who actually captures it? And there's an entire literature on that. And this is a, now one of the leading articles, um, just published a couple years ago, on, on uh, this concept of first possession within intellectual property. And the one reason, the other reason that I um, put this up is um, James Stern is a graduate of this law school, a clerk on the Supreme Court, and now, now is a professor at our cross-state uh, 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 law school of William and Mary Law School, where, where I once taught. Um, so, you know, that's, it just shows that, you know, we do uh, have, um, we keep our connection with our alums. So maybe some of you sitting here in the future can, can publish an article with one of your professors. This is not, this is not the only example. I could, I could, if you wanted to do that, if we wanted to talk about that, I could give you several examples. Um, new coming from the, uh, coming in the fall is Elizabeth Rowe, currently at another law school, which we will not mention. Um, but Elizabeth Rowe is a, is a really exciting addition uh, to our faculty um, uh, for many reasons. But, but here is, I think, one of the reasons that I'm extremely excited to uh, welcome her to our faculty, which is she is the leading um, casebook author, in other words, textbook author, on trade secret law, which is becoming incredibly important to our economy. The United States Congress just six years ago passed a statute making this area federal law. It had been state law for more than 200 years, and now it's federal law. It's increasing in importance. There's been big fights between, for example, on self-driving cars. There was enormous litigation. You can look it up on the New York Times if you, if you do a search for trade secrets, self-driving cars. You'll find out about this enormous multi-billion dollar litigation that led to somebody being criminally convicted for trade secret theft. He was, he was, ultimately, he was ultimately pardoned. Um, but anyway, I think this is a really uh, important addition. And I think we're one of the few law schools now that, that have somebody who's really top in her field in this, uh, in this uh, field. But uh, in addition to that, in addition to sort of, you know, I think nailing down our trade secret faculty as a, as a real um, uh, one of the top experts. She also writes on other things. Uh, this is an article that she published relatively recently on facial recognition technology, um, which I think shows her breadth. She's got another article on, on, um, on algorithmic uh, technologies and trade secret law in algorithmic technologies, a very, very hot subject about how um, how cities and states use algorithms for all sorts of things, including in criminal procedure and in detecting gunshots and other things like that. And she's got another article. It's still in draft form, I think, so I, I tried to just stick with the published articles. But anyway, I, I, I really think this is what makes Elizabeth, uh, my new colleague, uh, a great addition to the faculty because she's not just intellectual property. She has this incredible range, which I think our faculty um, is, um, 
is noted for. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that too. Uh, Rich Hines is a co-author of mine. He is a, um, if you look here, he's an expert in consumer finance, law and economics, bankruptcy contracts. You'll be like, why, why intellectual property? Well, this is the great thing about, um, about this law school is that we do think about the connections between one field and, and another field. So this is, an author, this is an article that I published with him a few years ago on the commercial law of intellectual property, which is one of the now a sort of important article on that aspect of intellectual property, which is extraordinarily important. It's intellectual property, once you have it, you have, to, you have to sell it, you have to buy it, you have to market it, you have to commercialize it. So this is the intersection between uh, two fields. Um, and also, I, I like my co-author, I'm gonna give a little blurb for him because he is the John Allen Love Professor of Law. So every uh, Valentine's Day, he comes in dressed like this, uh, which just goes to show, I think we're a serious law school, but we don't take each other too seriously, um, all, all things considered. Um, Danielle Daniel Citron uh, was uh, hired here just two years ago, um, and uh, she is a really great addition to our uh, faculty. She is a MacArthur Fellow which is, if you look that up, it's sort of informally called the genius grants, um, the genius people. So I can say, oh yes, I'm, I'm on a colleague with a genius. Um, she's a really great colleague, and one of the things that, um, that I think we want to emphasize, that I want to emphasize in this talk, is that intellectual property, or IP, is, is, is expanding, and it, the focus is not just on intellectual property of patents and copyrights and things like that, it also includes things about information, generally. This is one of the articles that, she has a whole portfolio of things, but I think this is one of the articles that really got her her, her genius grant, um, along with some books on the same subject, which really deal with how information is being used and abused in society. Um, and I think if you're interested in intellectual property, like traditional fields of intellectual property, like patents and copyrights, you have to think more broadly today. Your, your clients and the world itself is not going to present you with a problem that's just a copyright problem or just a trademark problem. They're going to present you with problems that are much more integrated into the information economy that you all are going to live the, the entirety of your careers in. Um, so I think this is, um, this is a, a great example of how we here at, at, um, at UVA are thinking more broadly about the, the phenomenon of IP, not just as intellectual property, but as, as, as informational property or information more generally. Um, this is my own page, you know, as, you can, as you can guess. Um, my scholarship has, uh, has, uh, has, I have tried, and I've done several things in my scholarship. One thing that I've done is I've tried to mix scholarship with practical thing. So this is an article I wrote um, that's a really, I think, pretty good history of the invention of this concept of the, the patentability standard, which I was inspired to write because of this, um, because of this thing I read by a German scholar. This, this uh, um, scholar here is, not only has a German sounding name, this is actually a, a person who's a German national who wrote this a while ago, and he said like, this idea of a, of a patentability requirement, which is, which is extraordinarily important today, and is litigated in pretty much every patent case, um, was invented by the United States Supreme Court. So this is a whole history of whether that's right. And, and the story is actually quite nuanced. Um, but one thing that I uh, did, I became very interested in this doctrine, and I thought the lower court was, the lower court that, that was interpreting it, that, that has a jurisdiction over patent cases, was getting it consistently wrong. So I worked on um, a, I was co-authored a petition for certiorari with a practitioner um, that went to the Supreme Court. This is the, the, the paper you have to file to get the Supreme Court to hear your case. You, they, don't, they don't have to hear any, or they have to hear very few cases. Most cases are discretionary. So you have to file this petition and plead with them, please, please take my case. And you have to make it sound interesting. And one of the ways that I made it sound interesting, I thought, was actually to include this German scholar's work and say, look, 
you know, the, even the Germans, you know, are following what you, the Supreme Court, have done. But the lower court isn't. The lower court is not following it. You know, so I said, it's fair to say that Europe, and there's other proof of this, is adhering more closely than the lower court, the federal circuit, to the conception of obviousness disclosed in this court's precedence. This un that unusual situation should end with this case. The court granted cert and unanimously reversed the lower court, reversed three decades of, of, um, of precedence on this, um, and, uh, and that was kind of fun. It actually, the decision came down while I was April 30th. It was like I was doing a review session. I got these, suddenly my phone started you know, going crazy. And I was like, wait a minute, I have to put the review session on hold. I have to figure out whether we won or lost. But we won unanimously, which was, I think, the right answer, of course. Um, but I didn't stop there. I actually wrote an, another article, which is, uh, which is on this standard of patentability um, with a co-author of mine. Um, and, uh, and this has, I think, become the, the most cited article on this, on this crucial doctrine of how much do you have to do to get a patent. So I think that's sort of an interesting mix of you know, doing real scholarship, having then an effect in the world, and then you know, doing even more scholarship. You know, like not just being, being a scholar, being a top scholar, trying to be a top scholar, whatever, um, but also trying to bring work into the, the real world. Um, one other thing I, that I uh, discovered in just sort of out of, out of curiosity, I began investigating something and figured out that um, all of, the, uh, of these officers who were called administrative patent judges in the patent office were unconstitutionally appointed. Um, and when I first did this, I actually published this very short article about this. It was a blog post, actually. And I went to a conference the next day, and I was talking to some like um, uh, lobbyists. And he was talking to me about some you know, down in the weeds, patenty thing. And at the end of our conversation, he sort of smirked at me. And he said, so all the judges are unconstitutional. And I said, yeah, that's actually true. This is going to be a big deal. Um, the New York Times ran an article. I don't know if this is a compliment. Uh, the, uh, the author, Adam Lipak, who's now their main Supreme Court author, said, I'm a different kind of law professor. <laughs> I, I'm taking that as a compliment, uh, I hope. But anyway, Congress changed the law, changed the appointment process within, uh, actually within months of this article, within a year of my, of my original blog post. Um, it was kind of fun to see that you know, it had such an effect. I got to be on weekend edition of NPR and other things like that saying, yeah, this is all unconstitutional. Um, it turns out that there's still more to that. The Supreme Court heard a case last year and held them once again unconstitutional. I have a new forthcoming article out with a, with a former student that's not here. Not, not in these slides. But anyway, that's kind of a fun thing. Um, and then this is, an audit. this is another Supreme Court case I did a few years ago. And these are two professors, Colleen Chen and Michael Risch, both professors at competitor schools. We won't talk about that. Um, anyway, uh, they actually said, uh, this is in the Washington Post, an op-ed, and says, you know, this thing is, this, this petition, this legal filing is filed by John Duffy of the University of Virginia. It's an excellent opportunity to address uh, where patent lawsuits can be filed, and we urge the court to take it. Um, and the court did take it again, and once again, unanimously reversed, which is always fun when you're right 100%. Um, and so some of the last things I'm working on is just um, the, uh, this is something I'm, I'm beginning to work on, which is, this is an article with one of my frequent co-authors, Michael Abramowitz, who's, at, uh, who's now the associate dean at George, uh, George Washington. A very good school, but you, you should, I want you to come here. Um, anyway, the, um, um, uh, it's about thinking about law as intellectual property. And, and this may sound like crazy, but it's actually a huge issue right now. Companies are copywriting things that are codes. And they are private companies that are getting copyrights and codes. There's a huge issue associated with this. Many people are against it. I'm sort of, you know, I, I think that, you know, intellectual property helps things get better. And if you look at our law, it's not clear it works well. And making it work well, making it work better, might not be a bad thing to encourage progress in. So anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of forward looking, I think, uh, not, it may work. Um, and here's another thing, like this is an article I just published last year with, again, my other co-author. I, I tend to keep my co-authors um, uh, on bail. And you might think, what is he writing about criminal procedure on? 
Well, it turns out bail, the, the institution of bail, this is criminal bail, is, is an information system. It's designed to generate information about whether this person is trustworthy or not. So my co-author is, is an expert in um, things like bankruptcy and consumer law and credit scores and things like that. And we realized that, that there is actually an informational component to this. And we came up with this proposal that sounds incredibly radical um, and really quite liberal, actually, which is, which is you know, not what you'd necessarily think from, a, from a, an ex-Scalia clerk. Um, but nonetheless, um, we're actually getting, we actually have uh, one foundation that's supporting this, and we're trying to actually make this a reality. This is an idea that can actually free lots of people um, and make the system more uh, rational. So in conclusion, I'll just say, I started out with this as IP at UVA, but I didn't tell you what the IP was. Um, and it could mean intellectual property at, at UVA, and it certainly is part of what I'm talking about. You could think that, you know, Things are getting broader. This field is broader. You don't just want to be an IP lawyer. That's not the way your clients will approach you. You want to think about informational property, much more broadly. And maybe you even want to think about informational protection at UVA, things like privacy, which my um, colleague Daniel Citron does, um, or other things that maybe you will help add to this field. But I am confident that you should think broadly about this field. And whether you come here, Hope you do. Um, or go elsewhere. Don't just think of yourselves as boxed into one corner of the universe. Be a great IP lawyer. Be great at patent law or copyright or trade secret law. Um, do great things in that, but also think about the broader things. Think about criminal procedure. Think about the Constitution. Think about other things that are um, adjacent to it. Think about antitrust. These are the things that I think, this is what I think makes UVA unique. We're, we're not preparing you just to do one thing. We're preparing you to be great lawyers, generally. Um, and intellectual property or informational property or informational protection, that's going to be part of a, a large segment of, the, uh, of, of practice in the 21st century. And that's where you're going to be practicing.